Well, glory. Listen, uh, <laughs> I did something this morning I've never done before, ever. I, I titled my message, and then I, after I got here, <laughs> Jeannie had everything done. I said, I've I got to change the message title. It went from, it's coming, which it is, to there's a river. There is a river. Church, we, we find ourselves living in a time uh, that is, uh, I, I, I guess, second to none. We, uh, you, you just stop for a moment and think about your life. Stop for just a moment and think about everything that's going on in your world. The, the, the chaos, the turmoil, the blessings of God, whatever the case may be, stop for a moment and think about that and realize and recognize that God has placed you here for such a time as this. For such a time as this. It's an amazing time that we find ourselves living in. These are trying times, and we can feel that there is a, this level of tension that is building toward the final showdown. Aren't you glad? <laughs> Aren't you glad that you know whose side wins? Woo! And we're on that side. Amen. We're on that side. Father, this morning this preacher needs your touch. God, I need your anointing. I need you to blow on that coal, that ember inside, Lord, and turn it into something of a fire, a raging inferno, Lord, that, that Lord, you would purify me, purify my thoughts, purify my mouth as I declare your word. I pray that you would take that the coal from the altar and touch these lips of clay with it, Lord, like you describe in your word, God, that I would be able to speak with clarity, speak the truth, speak with authority, Father God, your word this morning, that, Lord, there would be something of hope that would come from this, this, this vessel of clay today, that your church would leave here today encouraged and excited, even about the trying times that we find ourselves living in here today, and that those watching by way of the internet this morning could recognize and realize that there is something of truth this morning that, will, that we can give to the world that is out there. Lord, that we can minister here in our community and in our city, and that, we, that, that it can go by way of the internet around the world, literally, and set captives free. And God, I thank you for it, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Listen, man, things might look bad right now, but, they, but, but, they, uh, uh, but there is coming a day. There is coming a day, church. There's coming a day that will be so much more glorious than we could ever imagine. Some of the messages that I've been uh, speaking and, and preaching the last few weeks have have been in some ways kind of heavy and 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 those kinds of things. I want today's message. I want it to be something that brings some joy in your life. I want it to be something that lifts you up, something that you can walk out of here with a smile on your face and say, "I can do that." Listen in Genesis chapter one. The Bible story begins in a garden. In Genesis chapter 1, the Bible story begins in a, in, in a garden. And if you flip clear to the back of the book, in Revelations chapter 21 and chapter 22, the story ends in a city. All the way through the story points you and I to Jesus Christ. The garden and the city might seem a long way apart, but I'm telling you that God has brought them and is bringing them remarkably closer and closer and closer together all the time. 
The Bible begins with God creating the heaven and the earth. It ends with Him creating a new heaven and a new earth. Isn't that amazing? Everything that Adam lost will be restored and so much more. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation chapter 21. John the Revelator. John the Revelator saw Jerusalem coming down. (laughs) There's a song about that. John was being shown a vision. And he says now in verse 1, he says, now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For it was the first heaven And the first earth had passed away, also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them, and they shall be His people. God Himself will be with them and be their God. And, every, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And there shall be no more death. Hallelujah. And no, no sorrow. No more crying. There will be no more pain. For the former things have all passed away. Then he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said to me, Write, For these words are true and faithful. And then He said to me, It is done. (laughs) I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And I will give of the fountain of the water of life freely to him who thirsts. He who overcomes shall inherit all things. And I will be his God. And he shall be my son. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Listen, I can stop right there and say we have heard enough. Amen? I mean, there is coming a day. Woo! We can easily understand why God would make a new earth. Listen, this one's one's messed up. I mean, come on. This place is just messed up. It's easy for us to understand why God would make a new earth. But have you given any thought to why is it that God would make a new heaven? Why would God make a new heaven. What the heck's wrong with the one we got? I know, and you're about to know. We have to remember that before there was ever rebellion on earth, there was rebellion in heaven. Mm. Come on now. Remember that it was Satan who wanted to ascend to the throne of God. And because of it, he was cast out. Listen, church, the possibility of evil existed both in heaven and on earth. But now John sees that, there, that the enemy will be consigned to destruction forever. And that God will shape a new heaven free from not only the presence of evil, but even from its possibility. There will not be the possibility of evil and those kinds of things in the new heaven. John said he saw a new earth. A new earth. New means that it will be wonderfully different. It will be new. It will be wonderfully different. Earth means that it will be strangely familiar. The joys of the new heaven and the new earth are beyond anything that we can even imagine. But God uses two pictures to give us some inkling of what lies ahead for His people. They're, they're, they are the city and the garden. And we have to remember that John is seeing something of a vision that is yet to come. Church, vision 
is important. Vision is vital. There are guys like Glenn. There's guys like Bob that can look out in that, in that, in that parking area out there in that space of ground and see our building out there. I can't. Somebody's going to have to draw me a picture. That's what I thought we were getting over there. But that picture, if you've ever looked at it, you'll be like, what in the world is that? It's so messed up. That is not what our church is going to look like. I'm just telling you. It's upside down, inside out, and backwards. It's just messed up. I have to see a picture. I have somebody's got to write that thing down and show it to me. This is what it's going to look like. I can't see it. I'm not wired that way. The joys of, of the new heaven are going to be beyond anything. And vision is important. The Bible, in fact, says that, w- that without vision, the people will perish. So John sees in this vision the new city coming down from heaven and he immediately recognizes the skyline. That's Jerusalem. I recognize that. It's Jerusalem. Jerusalem is is full of significance in the Bible story, it's, this was the place where God came down to meet with His people when the cloud of His presence filled the temple. The Shekinah glory of God filled the temple. Where? In Jerusalem. Let me, let me, let me make a few comparisons for you here this morning. Listen, the old city had a holy place. Okay? The, the, the old city had a a holy place where where the presence of God came down. The new city is a holy place where God's presence will remain. Did you hear that? Did you understand that? Did you catch that? The old city had. Had. It's come and gone. The old city had a place where the presence of God came down to it just came down there it it didn't stay there it came down there the new city is in fact a holy place where god's presence will remain it will always be that's what makes heaven heaven god's gonna be there Woo! that's what makes hell hell god's not gonna be there you can keep the lake of fire the the bugs and all of that stuff that That ain't what makes hell hell. What makes hell hell is because God's not going to be there. The old city had a holy place where the presence of God came down. The new city is a place where God's presence will remain. In the old Jerusalem, one room was filled with His glory. In the new Jerusalem, the whole city will be filled with His glory. And a vast crowd of men and women, more than any could ever number, will live in His presence. Woo! Am I the only one in here with a pulse? I don't know, you must not be feeling what I'm feeling, but I'm stoked. This is for us, church. This is going to be for us. Me and you, all y'all and me are going to be in that place. Woo! I don't know, maybe I need to put out a disclaimer. This is a Holy Ghost Pentecostal church. You can clap. You can stand up. You can shout amen. You can yell, preach it, brother. You can say, come on. All that kind of stuff. You can get up here and wave a hanky. I don't care. Look at Revelations chapter 22 and verses 1 through 5. And he showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal. Reminds me of the North River. Just saying. He showed me a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding from the throne of God and of the Lamb. 
in the middle of its street and on either side of the river was the tree of life which bore 12 fruits, each tree yielding its fruit every month. The, leaf, the leaves of the tree were for the healing of nations. And there shall be no more curse. Woo! <clears throat> Excuse me. But, there, but, the, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and, and His servants shall serve Him. They shall see... Oh, glory to God. woo We shall see His face. And His name shall be on our forehead. There shall be no night there. We need no lamp nor light of the sun. For the Lord God gives them light. And they shall reign forever and ever and ever and ever. I added them last two. I added that. Glory to God. Up to this point in the vision John has viewed the new Jerusalem from the outside, but now he's been invited on the inside. Woo! Mm. Listen, if you ain't excited, your wood's wet. If you ain't starting to burn, your wood's wet. <laughs> Some of us are a little slow, but we're worth waiting on. <laughs> Hallelujah. He's invited to come inside. This section describes what could be called the New Eden. And what the first Garden of Eden was supposed to be is now being fulfilled in the New Eden. And what Adam and Eve would have had if they had not fallen is what God is giving to us, His people. Look at this. Listen to this. Adam and Eve lost paradise, but here God has remade it. One, th one thing, church, you'll not find. One thing you'll never find in the new heaven, in the new Garden of Eden, is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because you ain't going to need it. Because it ain't going to be there. It's all going to be good. Everything about it's going to be good. We're going to be so excited about just being there Evil is not going to be allowed. Evil's done way with and put in the pits of hell where it belongs. Amen. Glory to God. Evil can no longer be known there. This garden is not only free from the presence of evil, but its possibility. Even its possibility. The angel showed John the river of the water of life, clear as crystal, flowing down the middle of the street of the great city. And the water of life is, symbol, is, is a symbol of eternal life. Jesus used the same image with the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4, verses 7 through 14. Yeah, it's a lot of scripture, but we're going to go there and I'm going to read it to you. Because it's significant. It's significant. The, a woman, a woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. Now that ought to just make you stop and say, what in the world is going on here anyway? Because a Jewish man ain't never going to talk to a Samaritan woman. It just ain't going to happen. In fact, a Jew, a good Jew, isn't going to talk to a Samaritan to begin with. Period. Male or female. Because they were the dogs of society. And Jesus is sitting here at the well, and this Samaritan woman shows up, and Jesus says to her, give me a drink. The disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, a Samaritan woman? She couldn't comprehend it either. She didn't know what in the world's going on. Something strange is going on here. This Jew boy is talking to me, a Samaritan girl. She can't figure it all out. Jews have no dealing with Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it was that says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And the woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. And then you, so where then do you get living water? You know what she didn't know? He was the well, he is the well. 
And it's a deep well. It's a life-giving well. He's the well. Verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said, whoever drinks of this water is going to thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I will give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman said the obvious thing. Give me some. That's good preaching, Dave. Good job, man. <laughs> woo -hoo! Give me some. Yeah. The woman said, sir, give me this water that I may not thirst. And she puts another little thing on there so that I don't have to come back here again. <laughs> Amen. The water of life pictures the fullness of, of life with God and the eternal blessings that come when people believe in Him and allow Him to satisfy their spiritual thirst. Listen, church, there's people running rampant out there trying to satisfy their spiritual longings in booze and drugs and all these other kinds of things. And just Listen, you, ain't gonna, you are not going to be satisfied until you take a drink from the well. Till you let the living water get down inside of you. Nothing is going to satisfy you. I'm telling you in both the Old and the New Testament, water pictures salvation and the refreshment of the Holy Spirit. When you've had a dose of the ghost, ain't nothing else going to satisfy. Come on now. You need to get a dose of the ghost. Woo! I've had a drink at the well myself this morning. Amen? I'm telling you, in Ezekiel, look, look, at, look at Ezekiel. We're, we're just playing uh, Bible aerobics this morning. E Ezekiel chapter 47, the first nine verses, this is Ezekiel's vision also, and it has a river, and it has trees growing along with it. And then he brought me back in verse 1 of Ezekiel chapter 47. He says, then he brought me back to the door of the temple, and there was water flowing from under the threshold of the temple toward the east. For the front of the temple faced east. The water was flowing from under the right side of the temple south to the altar. And he brought me out by way of the north gate and led me around on the outside to the outer gateway that faces east. And there was water running out on the right side. And when the man went out to the east, with the line in his hand, he measured 1,000 cubits, and he brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my ankles. Hallelujah. And again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through the waters, and the water came up to my knees. Woo! And again, he measured 1,000 and brought me through, and the water came up to my waist. Glory to God. And again, he measured 1,000, and it was a river that I could not cross, for the water was too deep. Water in which one must swim. A river that could not be crossed. And he said to me, Son of man, have you seen this? And then he brought me and returned me to the bank of the river. And when I returned there, along the bank of the river, there was many trees on the side and on the other. And then he said to me, This water flows toward the eastern region. It goes down into the valley. It enters the sea. And when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And it shall be that every living thing that moves wherever the river goes will live. And there will be a very great multitude of fish because the water goes there. And they will be healed. And everything that lives wherever the river go goes. Me and Tammy have been to that sea. It's called the Dead Sea. It's so salty. It, I mean, it is so salty. You just lay in it and you just float like a cork. The mud at the Dead Sea they sell it. They sell it. I mean, them girls that was with us on that trip, 
They brought their daggum bathing suits and everything, and they were out there rolling around in that mud. There's all, I mean mud from head to toe. I'm like, there is no way I'm getting in that. It stunk so bad. I mean, it was bad. It's the Dead Sea. Because everything flows into the Dead Sea. Nothing flows out. Church, it's a picture of us if we're not careful. If you just sit here every Sunday, every Wednesday, and receive, and receive, and receive, and you don't let some of it out to somebody else, you are going to begin to stink. You are going to begin to die. I'm just telling you what God's principles are. You have too much information to withhold. There are people out there that need to hear from your mouth that God can save them and set them free. The Valley of the Dead Sea is a geological depression in which the Dead Sea lives. The Dead Sea is a body of water so salty that nothing can live in it. The river will freshen the Dead Sea the Dead Sea's water so that it can in fact support life. It's another picture of the life-giving nature of the water that flows from God's throne. Listen, you might be dead in your transgressions. That's what the Bible says. You might be alive, you might have a pulse, you might be breathing, but if you're dead in your transgressions, you're dead. I've not been around anything dead that didn't stink. Okay? I'm just... Some dead things stink worse than other dead things. I've noticed that as well. Amen? Some, it's, just, it's just the way it is. Nothing could live in it. The Dead Sea is the body of water, so salty. Nothing can live. The river, this river will freshen the Dead Sea's water so that it can in fact support life. It's a picture of the life-giving nature of the water that flows from God's temple. That's why it says in the Bible in another place that, that, uh, that, 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 that out of your belly will flow rivers of living water. You know why? Because it's an outflow of the good things of God that might splash on somebody. And as it does, it begins to produce life in you and I. God's power, listen, listen, pay attention. God's power can transform us no matter how lifeless or corrupt you might be. God's power, not this preacher's power. I ain't got enough power to blow up my nose. I'd think I'd sanctify that for just a second. Listen. God's power, God's power can transform us no matter how lifeless or cor- Jesus was the greatest preacher that ever lived. He never preached one funeral. He couldn't. Every time he went, they got, they, he resurrected them. <laughs> Listen, let me, just, let me just break the news to you. When the dead set up, funeral's over. Some of you will get that on the way home. When the dead set up, the funeral's over. He couldn't even preach a funeral. He messed them all up. Even, I don't know who you are. I don't know if you're watching by way of the internet today, but this is, this is important. Even when you feel messed up, And beyond hope, His power can heal you. The water in the new Jerusalem flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb. God in Christ, who is the water of life, according to John chapter 7, verse 37 and 38. It is the source of this constant stream of blessing and refreshment for his people. This river flows down the middle of the main street of the city and is accessible to everyone. We will have access to that river. 
Back in Revelation chapter 22, verses 3 and 4, it says, There shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. And they shall see His face. His name shall be on their forehead. God's presence in that city is its greatest blessing. In the Garden of Eden, God came down as a visitor and made Himself known. But he did not impose himself on the man or the woman, but gave them the opportunity to choose a relationship of faith and obedience with him. That's the offer today, church. Joshua said in chapter 24, Joshua said, choose you this day whom you're going to serve. That's exactly what's happening here. God did not impose himself. Listen, God is not going to impose himself upon you, no matter how excited this preacher gets, no matter how much I jump up and down. God is not going to impose himself on you. You're going to have to make a decision when he stands at the door of your heart and begins to knock. You're going to have to open the door. I don't know. We used to have a picture or I've seen it somewhere, uh, uh, of Jesus standing at a door. You've seen that picture? And he's knocking on the door. You ever really look at that door? There ain't no doorknob on it. There's no doorknob on that door. Jesus is standing and he says, Behold, I knock. I stand and I knock. And I bid you to invite me in. I'm not coming in. I don't even have a doorknob. I can't turn the doorknob if I wanted to. I can't come in. Now, he, we know he could come in, but he ain't going to. It's up to you. Jesus gives us the opportunity to choose a relationship of faith and obedience. Revelations 22, verse 16 and 17. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David. The bright and morning star and the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who hears say, come. Let him who thirsts, come. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Listen, there is no greater invitation than that invitation to come right there. Listen, he, the brides and the, the spirit and the bride say, come. Let him who, did you hear me? Did you hear the word of the Lord? Then he says, let them come. And he says, let him who thirsts, anybody thirsty for the things of God, whoever desires, take, let him take of the water of life freely. Jesus is inviting all who are thirsty. We sing a song like that. All who are thirsty. All who are we? Come to the fountain. Dip your heart in the stream of life. Let the pain and the sorrow be washed away. And the waves of His mercy as deep cries out to... I better stop. That's the invitation, church. That's the invitation. All who are thirsty come to the water of life. And He gave His people the privilege and the opportunity to continue to extend that glad invitation. That's you, church. Did this die? That was your cue to jump up and say, Yeah, I'm on my woo. I'll just read this again. Jesus invites all who are thirsty to come to the water of life, comma, and he gave his people. I'll wait. I'll wait. You're getting closer. I've nearly, nearly got us all. Hallelujah. He gave His people the privilege. He gives us, it's a privilege, church, 
to declare the name of Jesus Christ. It's not a burdensome thing. It's not a scary thing. It's a privilege and an opportunity to continue to extend that glad invitation. There's no doubt that people around the world thirst for for life, but there's no there's no shortage of God's life giving water. The Lord opened the way to everlasting life for you and I. His offer, he offers this to all, but you must come. Come and receive the life that he offers you. Come to Him because His people will enter into this marvelous city. I cannot wait for that day. The challenge is to let those thirsty ones hear the Word. You've heard it. And you're going to hear it again. And again, and again, and again, and again, and again. Oh, because that's who I am. That's who God wired me to be. I'm not a theologian. You figured that out by now. I don't know all the Greek and the Hebrew. I knew one little Greek guy about like that. But I know about salvation. And I think God has given me a a unique ability to communicate the gospel in a way that people... I'm not bragging on myself. I'm just explaining the gifting that God has placed in my life the way He wired me. I've heard it said that there's no greater miracle. There's no greater miracle than for someone to give their life to Jesus. To be born again. There is no greater miracle. The challenge is to let those thirsty ones hear the word. Bow your heads with me, church. Come to the water. Can you do come to the water? Or all is thirsty, whatever the name of it. Okay, good. Bow your heads with me. challenge is to let those thirsty ones hear the word. You, seated in this place today, have heard enough of the word of God. I've given you enough scripture. I've given you encouragement. I have given you the something of the presence of the Holy Spirit. You have been given. You've heard You've heard everything you need to hear. What you can do with this gospel. There's a world out there, church, that's dying. That neighbor that's a little cantankerous. Maybe even, maybe he's even been ugly to you from time to time. But have you ever stopped and shared Jesus with them? That little little kid that rides his bicycle through your flower. Did you ever tell him about Jesus? Did you ever explain to him that those flowers are more than just flowers in your flower bed? They are they are an expression of Jesus, the creativity of Jesus, the life-giving power of Jesus to take a, a, a bulb that don't look like nothing and turn it into something so beautiful as a flower, a daffodil, or a gladiola, or a tulip. The challenge is to let those thirsty ones hear the word. Consider today what part God wants you to play in giving water to a thirsty world. Yes, you can pray. Yes, you can pray. Yes, you can share the gospel with a friend. Church, you can can feed the poor in the name of the Lord. 
you, you can even support missionaries and missions organizations. God has a purpose and a plan for you. He wired you just the way you're wired because that's the way He wants to use you. I close with this. People are dying of thirst. And we have the water. We have the water. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. People are praying. Who needs a drink? Who needs a drink? I'm not talking about a drink that will wet your palate. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about who needs a drink? of life-giving water fresh from the fountain. He took me out and he measured a thousand cubits this way and, and I stepped in the water was ankle deep and we went around and measured another thousand and I stepped in the water was knee deep and we went around measured out another one and I stepped in and the water was up to my waist and we went and did it again and the water was a river that was so big you had to swim you couldn't walk you couldn't crawl. Why did it grow exponentially like that? Because it's showing you and I that there's enough water to go around. There's enough water to go around. God's power can transform you no matter how lifeless or corrupt you might be. Even when you are feeling completely messed up and completely beyond hope, God's power, one drop of the blood of Jesus can refresh you and rejuvenate you and heal you and restore you. I'm telling you, church, God will do that for you. Are you here today? Are you watching by way of the internet today? The devil's lied to you. You are messed up. You're beyond hope. There's no hope for you. Hey, I was told that. I was told that one time. I'll tell you how what I was told. I was told by a person that I admired. A man of God that I looked up to and I had some stuff in my life and he told me you know what the devil's got your head mounted as a trophy on his wall there's no hope from you I got that from a man of God and so I bought into it and I believed it and I lived that way for a while I just went buck wild but there was something inside of me of the water of life that just kept splashing around in there And I had to ask myself a question one day. If there's no hope for me, why do I keep feeling like I need to repent? And I repented. And I ain't never been the same since. The devil's hated me ever since. He's tried to kill me ever since. He's tried to take me out ever since. He hates you. And he will try and take you out. I'm just telling you that there is hope for you. You are not so corrupt that you can't be healed. You're not so, so messed up and beyond hope that the power of the Holy Spirit of God, the blood of Jesus, the water of life can't refresh you. All you got to do is open the door. He's knocking this morning, church. He says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. And if you'll just open the door, I will come in and sup with you and you with me. That's a promise from God. Are you here? Is that you today? Anybody in this place say, preacher, that's me. Today I need to give my life to Jesus. Today I need to surrender my life completely. I, I have been listening to the enemy. And he has tried to convince me that my life is so messed up, there's no hope for me. There is hope for you. His name is Jesus. 
Maybe you're watching today by way of the internet, and I, I would just take a moment and address you personally. There is hope for you. There is enough love in the arms of Jesus to love you. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. He saw you when He made that statement. He saw each one of us in this room. He saw every one of our, our, our need when He made that statement. When He sent Jesus, He said, Because whosoever, you and I are whosoever, you are whosoever. The devil might have you isolated right now, but I want to challenge you and encourage you to get out of your house and go to church. The devil will tell you that people will judge you. They won't hear. We'll love you because we've been called to love. God is love. And if we're going to imitate Him, we better be able to love and we love you. If you're here today and you say, Preacher, I either need to accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior for the very first time, or Preacher, I need to recommit my life to Jesus because I've believed the devil and I've been going crazy for a while, but I believe that there's enough water in the river even for me. And I want to be refreshed. And I want to be renewed. And I want to recommit my life to you today. If you're here, raise your hand. Say, Preacher, that's me. Anybody at all, say, Preacher, that's me. Maybe you're watching by way of the internet. I don't know. I can't see you. But if you would raise your hand, if you'd write down a little note in the comment section, I'm giving my life to Jesus. If you'll pray this prayer with me in this congregation, I promise you that God will save you and set you free. Father, I thank you for this day. I ask you now to come into my heart to forgive me, to refresh me, to fill me with living water, to write my name in the Lamb's book of life, to forgive all my sin, and to walk with me and fill me with your Holy Spirit. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Hey, God bless you. Thanks for joining us today on the internet. Thank you for being here with us. Again, thank you for your generosity. And, and I pray God gives you a fantastic week. Wednesday, don't forget to be here on Wednesday night. Amen. Listen, God bless you. God go with you. Have a great rest of your day. We'll see you later.